Hey, welcome everybody. Let's talk real estate. Your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current commercial real estate market here in Southern California. As we take a no BS look at both sides of the issues driving this market today to find the best solutions going forward. With our man right in the middle, Barry Saywitz. Hey, Barry. Hey, good morning, Paul, and good morning to all of our viewers and our listeners out there. Welcome back again. It's Tuesday. Um, we're here to talk real estate. I am Barry Saywitz, president of the Saywitz Company and managing partner of Saywitz Properties. And if there's one thing I've learned in my 30 plus years of doing this, it's important to take a look at both sides of the equation, make informed business decisions as best you can, surround yourself with experts and uh, and try and do the best you can in uh, with the cards that you've got. And, and in today's world, we are no different. I'm excited about uh, today's show and I'm pleased to welcome our esteemed guest, Ed Colson, who is a uh, professor of economics uh, at UCI at the Paul Mirage School of Business and also the director of the UCI Center for Real Estate. He had a long commute to get here. Ed, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so I I'm excited, number one, because we broadcast from UCI. This is where our studio is, University of California, Irvine. And uh, we've always talked about, hey, we should get somebody from the university since we're here every week. And so I'm glad you're here and, and happy to have you share your thoughts and input with us. Yeah, it's great to be here. I did have a very long commute. Yeah, and I'm sure you're, uh, you got lost. You can't use the excuse, I got lost getting here. You, you know where it is. <laughs> but um, but so uh, I want to start with, so your background, um, you've taught uh, at a number of different universities. Uh, long history in economics, published a bunch of uh, articles and, and, and papers and theses. How did you end up at UCI from all of your other travels? Uh, I grew up in Southern California, spent part of my childhood in Fullerton, uh, but I really grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, did my um, uh, BS and PhD degrees at University of California campuses. Uh, so I'm a UC person, um, but when you have the job I do, um, you're in the national job market. So I went back east for uh, several decades. I taught at uh, mostly Penn State University, Go Nittany Lions, Rose Bowl champions. Yeah. And um, then spent a couple of years trying to get back to California. I spent a couple of years at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, directing their center for real estate. And then in 2017, <clears throat> I was very fortunate enough to um, become director of the Center for Real Estate here at UCI. So they found you and they hooked you and they brought you here? Well, you know, I, I had always put the word out that if there was a good situation for me back in Southern California that I was open to listening and uh, it eventually happened. Yeah, and so a little bit warmer, maybe not this morning since it's chilly out here in Southern California, but a little bit better than in Pennsylvania, uh, at least these months out of the year. I, I always say when the weather gets bad here i always just look at you know pennsylvania weather and then i remind myself it's not I so bad right yeah. exactly yeah. And, and i too am a product of the uc system and i would just say that you know there uh, from a public education standpoint uh to me there probably is no better and i have watched as a longtime resident of orange county and, and living down the street from the campus i've w really watched this campus grow up uh get developed really expand its a uh, variety of different uh, educational opportunities that it, it has for students and then really become one of the top uh, universities in the country from a recognition standpoint and and in today's world uh, one of the most applied to universities in general uh, in, in the whole country if not the world there there's a lot to be proud of uh, in Orange County uh, about UCI it's uh, it sometimes flies a little bit under the radar compared to our uh, neighbors to the north but um, it's one of the, it really is one of the top, certainly top public universities, certainly top universities in the country, and it's an awesome place. And I'm so proud to be part of it. Yeah, and and due to in part the generosity of uh, major benefactors and successful business people, like I'll mention a Donald Bren or a Samueli family or a Mirage family, who have given back to the community and really helped to expand the um, th the scope of what the university has to offer. So with Mirage on the business side or uh, with Samueli on the engineering and health sciences. Yeah. It, it, it's really just a, a much bigger, more comprehensive place than it was 20 years ago, for sure, at least from mm -hmm. my perspective. Yeah, totally agree. So, and it's also interesting that Orange County's uh, center, not only is it tourism because we're near the beach and it's a great place to live, but a lot of the economy is centered around real estate. People who bought their homes here years ago have made 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars off of just owning their home and sitting on it. Uh, the development here in Orange County over the past 20 or 30 years is just exponential relative to most other places in the country. So it, it stands to reason that UCI would have its own real estate center or programming that it would offer to students or, or to the community. And so I remember when the Center for Real Estate was first sort of put together and it was sort of a fledgling thing. But today it's really full functioning uh, uh, center where it has brought in community leaders uh, from all over. Uh, talk about that a little bit because you are in charge of that and, and the programming and some of the activities that you guys have. Yeah, uh, you know, we've got the three kind of standard missions of, of that a center like ours would have. We uh, we are an education center. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit administratively tricky because it's not um, my, in my role as center director, I don't have any direct you know, administrative uh, ability over the curriculum, but as a faculty member, I do. Uh, so, but we, uh, the center interacts with the educational mission of the Paul Mirage School. Uh, we facilitate bringing in guest speakers to our classes. Uh, we hire uh, lecturers, uh, adjuncts out of, the, out of the real estate community here to teach our uh, MBA students. Our, our educational mission is twofold. We have uh, a very active master's degree pro, um, option within the MBA degree. We don't have a separate master's of real estate or mm -hmm. anything like that, but there is a, there's a real estate option within the um, MBA degree. We offer a, uh, a couple courses each quarter. Uh, and if you if you take a certain number of them, you get a you get a real estate immersion. We can't call it a certificate. Ah. Uh, we can't call it a concentration for whatever reason. The university tells us that what we have is an immersion mm. in real estate, and um, we have um, a number of students take up that option every year. Um, we have a, a very uh, interesting and I think innovative in some ways curriculum. We're offering courses that I don't think are offered elsewhere. I, uh, and um, I'm really proud of the instructors. They've all done a fantastic job. They really engage the students with their own personal uh, stories of, of their uh, adventures in real estate. They're all people who are active in industry. And, uh, and then there's an undergraduate program, which I'd like to expand actually, but is limited right now to one course, but um, the, uh, uh, which I teach, uh, and the undergraduate students are just fantastic as well. We have a very, very uh, um, active set of um, student organizations, one at the uh, MBA level and one at the undergraduate level, which the center supports uh, and facilitates their activities as well. Um, we reach out to the uh, real estate community through events that we hold. We have three uh, breakfast series events that uh, we do at the Pacific Club once a quarter. The next one is actually, I think, next week. Oh. I, I should have checked my Let's calendar before I got here. Um, but we're doing a great, uh, a great program. I think it's uh, a week from tomorrow. So check that out. Check our website on that. Um, and for those listening, let's give them the website if you have it, or we, it's, uh, it's uh, well, probably just, UCI just, Real Estate. Just Google UCI Center for Real yeah. Estate. You'll find us. Um, and uh, uh, some bigger events each year. In uh, November, we had our what we call the board meeting, but it was open to everybody, uh, where we had a, a, an, a whole afternoon of great speakers and panels. And I gave my little chat about what my, where I thought the the, um, the economy and the real estate market was going in Orange County. And um, we'll have some other events during the year. Some We do a few online events as well. Uh, so we're constantly engaging with the community, the real estate community in Orange County. And you have some pretty big partners in the community that help support the Center for Real Estate. Real estate. So, I mean, some of the big developers and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those are also benefactors and, and donors to the university as well. But um, uh, the Orange County is really made up of some master developers, and you, you've done a good job, I think, of bringing those in, i.e. I. Irvine Company and Shea and some of these others. Right. I mean, we've got a whole uh, um, advisory board that uh, does a lot for us. Uh, they uh, help us organize these events. They get the speakers. Their connections bring uh, guest speakers to the classroom, uh, et cetera, and um, 
uh, yeah, the, a lot of the major uh, real estate people in Orange County are are, are uh, engaged with us. Yeah, and it's it's really awesome, actually. I, I I couldn't be happier with the support that the community gives us. We always like more. Sure. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, give us a send us an email or drop us a line, and we will be happy to. Uh, uh, speak with you about how you can be engaged with our students and with our events yeah well I'm, I'm happy to help out and if there's anybody else out there listening that wants to help then uh, track ed down and he'll be happy to bring you in and take up some of your time so uh and, and relative to the center for real estate i mean there are other universities uh i.e i, I, won't, I don't want to plug too much but i mean a ucla or a chapman that puts out their economic report that i know business leaders and and, and many folks out there look to those reports as sort of a, a marker of of a fairly good indication of what they think will come and i i know uci is now doing i mean with your speaking as well doing some of that in terms of trying to help guide uh where the expectations might be going forward and is there a, a goal as part of the business plan, if you will, to expand that as well? I mean, you have such a, a, a deep knowledge yourself along with the board of directors. I do a lot of speaking engagements with with um, uh, groups in Orange County and L.A. County, for that matter. Um, we don't have, I don't think UCI has a formal kind of economic forecast conference. Um, certainly the business school does not. Um, but I'm happy to give my opinion about that at, at any time. It's uh, well, that's it's, one of the reasons we're here. Yeah, so that was so sort of leads. It's a great lead into my next sort of <laughs> where do we think it's going? But I, relative, just to to close the loop on yeah. the Center for Real Estate mm -hmm. and the real estate program. I mean, give me your thoughts. But is the plan to continue to expand the real estate aspect component of the center, and also as part of the Palmerage Business School as uh, time moves on? Uh, to, to help make real estate more of an integral piece of what's going on? Or, or well, I hope so. Um, the, the real estate center is always growing. Our classes are expanding. Our enrollments in those classes are, for the most part, at the absolute max. Yeah, great. And the st student interest in real estate as a career option is, uh, to me, is at an all-time high. Yeah. Um, it's And it's an awesome thing to see. It's... Um, I always say that students don't always recognize the importance of real estate to their future career pathways. I think if more students end up in real estate than recognize it when they're a student and they come, they, 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 they say, I wish I'd taken more real estate courses when I was at UCI, if I'd known how important it was going to be, especially if you're going to stay in Orange County, because as you pointed out, you know, real estate's an important part of the Orange County economy. Um, and so uh, a lot of people do, a lot of students do end up in real estate, even if they don't know it at the, at the time that they are well, a student. Look, and I think everybody's in real estate to some degree, and maybe you're not an expert, but if you're renting a home, if you're renting an apartment, if you choose to look to buy a home, if you would look to uh, one day buy an investment property, if your parents pass away and leave you a piece of real estate, all of a sudden you now are in the real estate world in some form or fashion. And so... Uh, there's a whole plethora of, of whether it's articles that I've written or classes that you could teach uh, to teach people about at least the basics understanding of how the economy ties back into the real estate. Oh, sure. And I'll, I'll say one other thing about that. I teach the undergraduate course and I'll, an awful lot of undergraduate students sort of have in their head when they think about a real estate career, they think about agency and brokerage. Yeah. And and that's that's, that's great. It's but, all very small, but piece. it's a it's a piece. It's not the only piece. And they are their eyes go wide open when they when I bring a developer uh, into the classroom and they talk about just the joy. I think that this is one of the amazing things about real estate people is that they get such joy out of you know creating something a physical a building and um, you know creating a community even and and um, and uh, students don't actually kind of don't totally grok that um that's all real estate yeah and you know the way they live you say you know what is real estate well just look around you that's all real estate people made all of this happen yeah uh, and there's and there's so many aspects to the real estate world uh whether it's construction or finance or development or management that are separate from the brokerage i think you know i tell people say to me what do you do for a living? I say, I own a real estate company. They say, oh, uh, what's my house worth? Or is the housing no. working? I, I, don't, I don't sell houses. Right? That's how <laughs> we 
do. But no. but it is interesting that uh, there's no question that the economy and the real estate uh, uh, are tied together. So when you look at the dynamics from an economic standpoint, right. it does trickle back, and certainly in Orange County, in, in Orange County, directly back to. Uh, the real estate, which then funnels back to buyers, sellers, investors, renters, all all across the mm-hmm. board. Exactly. So I think that's a good segue into uh, you know your perspective of what's going on in the economy. Obviously, if we would have rewound uh, the the guests, we've been doing the show now 15 months. The first guests that we had on the show for probably the first six months, I said, "Hey, how's the market looking for the coming year?" And everybody was rosy and and it was all good, and we're looking upward and everything. There's no kinks in the armor. And now we have folks coming in going, hey, wait a minute, there's there's some real issues here. And, and there have been for some time. And, and so I guess I'm curious, and, and I'm sure the viewers and the listeners out there are as well, um, your perspective of where we have come in the last six months uh, and, and then your expectation, no one's got a crystal ball, but uh, of where we're headed for the next uh, six months or so in terms of the economy in general as it relates to the major things that are going on, supply chain, inflation, uh, and, and then certainly back to housing market, which is a, a mouthful. But right. uh, I'm curious as to <laughs> – There you, were a you, lot of questions yes, in there. <laughs> you, could, you could do a couple of lectures on that one for sure. Um, so, so where to start? Uh, well, the big economic headline is about inflation. And the, the uh, without going into – too much into the weeds. Um, we had we had major acceleration of inflation coming out of COVID, and then it was kind of accelerated by the further supply chain disruptions that came about because of the the conflict in the Ukraine, yeah. and that drove uh, gas and oil prices very high, and that was a significant driver of inflation. At the time, we also had. Uh, housing inflation. We're talking about maybe a year ago. Right. Um, we had we had house price and rental inflation as well. Massive. Massive. Historically and, speaking. And that was largely driven by um, people realigning their housing preferences in light of COVID. People wanted uh, to not have, you know, single people did not want to have roommates anymore, but they still needed bigger uh, places to live because they were working from home, needed a separate room for a, a home office sure. or um, or whatever, and that drove housing demand to to a new level. And so, unlike um, unlike what was happening in two thousand five to two thousand eight, and we had massive house and pri- house price inflation, yeah. then this was not a there was no bubble about this because rent to value ratios were pretty much constant from about April of 20 through about the summer of 22. So there was no, there was no bubble. It was the house price inflation was driven by rental inflation. And so it didn't have any, it was, it was fundamentals. It wasn't, it wasn't kind of a, you know, a a house investment driven uh, price inflation. And so for the layman out there, and I get it, but for the layman out there, if the price of the house goes up, then the cost of living there goes up. And so then the person who is renting says, hey, it, it's more expensive, maybe I'll stay. But then when they stay, there's very low vacancy on the rental side. So it drives up the price of the rental side, which then someone says, well, geez, if I'm paying X for rent, maybe I should just buy the place. And so th- they sort of feed back and forth. And, and I think it gets back to this supply demand. You had very low inventory on the housing side and then very low inventory on the apartment side. And and you have this this sort of run up in the double digits, if you will. Right. So, and and, and one of the reactions to this in terms of California real estate was that people exited California. Um, I don't think that so so it's well documented that there is exit from California. There's entry too. California is a big state. There's lots of people coming in, lots of people going out at the same time. But the net migration out of California was largely uh, driven by these high mm-hmm. housing prices. Um, part, maybe taxes too, but I think probably 90% of that out migration is driven by house prices. And so people move to, to Phoenix or Las Vegas or Texas you know, or Texas. Florida or anywhere, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean the, the, the fashionable places were in places like Boise yeah. and Helena, Montana, I suppose. Um, but, um, 
But those places also started exhibiting the same kind of rental inflation and therefore house price inflation that we were seeing in California. So all this is just supply and demand working itself out. There are people whose attachment to California maybe wasn't as strong. And so when prices start to go up and the cost of living it gets high here, they're they're, they're, they go to someplace else. But that what that does is it leaves behind the people who really like California. And so California housing prices are always going to be high because there's there's quality of life things. I mean, I would never move, you know, back to Pennsylvania, right. for example. Uh, it's fine so. to visit maybe June, uh, <laughs> but other than that. Um, but that, you know, here's what's interesting is that around last summer, um, those uh, sort of housing market equilibrium began to sort themselves out. And so rents started to flatten in California. This is what's unrecognized about the way the housing market has worked relatively, is that rents, apartment rents have basically flattened out since a mid to late summer in, in most of California, not everywhere, but most of California. And so I, I take that to be that there's some kind of, that, that we've reached an equilibrium because at the same time, uh, rents in these other places that we just mentioned also flattened out, except for Montana. Montana rents are still yeah. going up. So uh, so there's still some issues to be worked out there. But what that also means is that if, if rents are flattening out, it, also, it means that house prices are also going to flatten out. So independent of the of the uh, uh, um, damage, if that's the right word, to housing prices caused by higher interest rates, which right. we haven't even talked about, um, you knew that values were going to flatten out because rents were going to flatten out. Because if rents flatten out, then investor demand for house uh, you know, housing as an investment is going to flatten out as well. And so we've seen not just a, a flattening out of house prices, but actually a decline, which is absolutely going to be the consequence of, of rents just even flattening. Rents don't even have to go down for house prices to go down, but but they've gone down. And... Um, you know, we will continue to see a little bit more of house to price decline as we go forward through the first half of 23. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and you know, for people who have seen uh, cycles in the market, right, nothing goes up forever. Real estate certainly does not go up forever. And the, the real question is, is that I have for you is, does the dynamic of supply versus demand outweigh or for lack of a better word, Trump? the whole interest rate increase because the interest rate increase takes all of the lower and middle buyers, I think, out of the market or reduces them dramatically because they say, hey, I either can't afford it, it's more expensive, I can't qualify for the loan, I can't qualify for as big a house as I wanted, maybe I'll just keep renting and then I'll wait and maybe fight another day. The higher uh, end homes are not so much interest rate sensitive because those people are more price sensitive. And now with a softening in the market, they come back and try and renegotiate the price because there's some softening. But it's interesting that there is still low inventory, uh, both on the apartment side and on the home sale side. So when you go to buy something, it's, there's just not that much stuff out there if you want to rent. Right, because people, if, if you're a homeowner, you don't want to move. Right, because, so they don't move because they go, where am I going to go? Well, they're locked. Well, not just that, but they're right now locked into a very low interest rate. And right. if they try to, you, you can't carry that with you under you know, the vast majority of circumstances. So you're going to be looking at a higher interest rate. You know, there's always this interaction between interest rates and prices. And, you know, kind of one thumbnail model is that is that they interact with each other to keep the, the monthly payment the same. Right. Um, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but it's something that people kind of talk about as being, you know, uh, an interesting model of, of how uh, house prices well, it, it, it's also interesting if you took a survey of how many folks that are out there, do they make their de their decision making process based on the monthly payment or based on the actual price of the asset? Because I think it's different for for some folks than others. Well, it's both because you know qualifying for a mortgage, one of the metrics they look at is your payment to income right. ratio, and so you're not going to get you're not going to be able to get a mortgage if that ratio is too high. Yeah, so which means you have to pay less, which means if I want that house, I'll just go offer less and maybe the guy will take it, maybe he won't. If he doesn't, I got to move on and go find something else. Sure. The other dynamic that, that we find in our world that's interesting is we have a lot of tenants there, uh, what I'm going to call on yesterday's rent. So if they signed a lease a year or two ago, or if they had a lease and then we as the landlord didn't give them a very big increase because of COVID, we were working with our tenants. And then while that's going on, the market shoots up. And so now you have someone who is paying 
um, I'll pick a number, $500, $1,000 less than their next door neighbor who just moved in. And now you have this discrepancy. And so you have the, the, that dynamic of a shell shocker for tenants that are getting their rents increased uh, and, and, and either don't like it, can't afford it, or it, it's different than it was before. Well, you bring up a very, very interesting dynamic, and I'm going to risk getting into the weeds here a little bit. But this has what you just said has direct implications for how we measure inflation, and it's it's one of the one of the one of my research topics. It's actually gotten a lot of press recently. We were, our work was featured in the Washington Post about mm, a month great. ago, um, but we've been banging on this drum for about ten years or more that the way that the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures rental inflation is completely wrong for reasons that you've just described, which is that when when they measure inflation in rents for purposes of putting it into the consumer price index, what they do is they survey sitting tenants. And so they just ask people, what, you're, what are you paying for rent? Right. And the response is gonna be, well, it's what I contracted six, 12 months ago. And so that's great if you wanna measure the cost of living, but if you're gonna use the consumer price index right. to, to um, uh, gauge monetary policy. You don't want that to be your rental number. What you want is real-time rental contracts that are being signed today. I agree. And so, you know, we discovered that, you know, in a, in a, in some work we did God, almost a decade ago that the consumer price index had the people that measure the consumer price index had measured rents as being flat during the great recession from 2005 to 2010 yeah. or 11. Well, that's ridiculous. And so when we imputed, we figured out a real-time contemporaneous measure of inflation from new rental contracts that were being signed contemporaneously, we found that rents were falling during the Great Recession. Yeah. Same thing's happening today. When rents were skyrocketing a year ago, the consumer price index measure of rents was pretty flat. <laughs> they hadn't yeah. caught up to the fact that rents were really rising. And now they see rents as, as rising. Right now they're seeing rents as rising, but we know real estate professionals know rents are falling. Right. You're just, all have to do, you don't have to take our word for it. We have a separate you know, real-time rental index, but all I have to do is look at Zillow's rental data and they show that rents are falling contemporaneously. And if you had imputed those rents real-time rents into the consumer price index, you would oh, find yeah. that the inflation rate would be a percentage, uh, one and a half percent lower than the official government numbers. And so we knew that inflation was going to come down in this, this past three months it's interesting. Uh, because, you know, we saw what rents were, what the, what the consumer price index measure of rents was going to do because we had, because that measures lagged and we had a contemporaneous measure. So, <laughs> seems like the government. Sorry, I told you we we're going to get in the weeds no, no. A bit. I, I like it because, <laughs> and we could go all day. We, we yeah. don't have a lot of time. <laughs> but, but what what we always talk about in our office is that that you use the Zillow example, and I I have friends of mine that say, hey, I I'm seeing places that used to be four thousand dollars a month, and now they're thirty five hundred dollars a month, or now they're thirty eight hundred a month, or or you look and you see there's a price decrease on the MLS where the arrow goes down. Right, and so people's perception again is the market is falling, the market is soft, prices are coming down. So I will offer or I will act based on the fact that it is falling. And then the converse of that, although I, I agree 100% with everything that you've said, the converse of that from a real time standpoint is, look, that number at pick your number, $4,000 a month was a stupid made up number. And that number was based on taking yesterday's number, which was high, and then just working up from there, thinking that the market just goes up forever. And so now you've come back from 4,000 to 3,800, and then that's still a, sort of a stupid number. And so the real number might be $3,600. And if you just started there, then it would have rented right away. But the perception is rents are falling and, and that's the case. And so th there's, there's two sides to it real time, right? And then the other side of it is, what about the person who's paying $2,500 next door to the guy who moves in at $3,600 and that guy's gonna get a significant increase. His personal cost of living is not going down. His personal cost of living is right. going up. Yeah, one of the things about inflation is that everybody has their own CPI. Yes. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to generalize about what the actual cost of living is. Uh, you know, to, to 300 something million people. Yeah, no, no, it's an interesting topic. We could go on it all day. They're waving at me that we've only got a minute or two left. I <laughs> told you it was go quick. And then when you get into it, 
uh, we could do a, a whole series. You should do like a lecture where you have people uh, that have uh, come in and debate the uh, the dynamics of the market from a landlord perspective or a developer perspective. I think it'd be interesting because they would they would argue where rents are going or where property values are going. And for another day, I'd love to have you come back. We talk about cap rates and how interest rates and cap rates and the inversion curve that you have today where interest rates are higher than cap rates, whether that actually holds or not. It's a whole different show. But yeah. but, but for our viewers and our listeners out there, in, in a general perspective, if you could sum up where you think it's headed, um, what I'm hearing is inflation on the downtick, real estate markets in terms of prices have flattened and maybe started to dip at this point. Do you see that trend continuing? I, I you know, I hope so. Um, as the real, as the, sorry, as the consumer price index measure of rental inflation catches up to the real time measure, we're going to see a softening of inflation. We've already seen it. Um, and there's lots of other good news about the, the, the components of the CPI that we worry about. Obviously, gas prices yeah. and, and car prices, they've all come down significantly. So we're going to see a tremendous moderating of inflation numbers uh, as, we, as we move forward into 2023. And presumably, that will convince the Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell that we do not need the big uh, uh, interest rate increases that we, we've seen since what July and, yeah. and we talked earlier about how the the um, the basis point increases for uh, the the Fed funds rate has has been unprecedented and it was just it was just a matter of Chairman Powell saying look we got to get inflation below the the, the federal funds rate because otherwise we're giving away money yeah. and so he's gonna he wanted to continue to raise inflate raise interest rates until it got below the inflation rate and um, uh, sorry, above the inflation rate, and um, we're 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 beginning to see that. We're, we're certainly inflation has has moderated, uh, and so I don't expect there to be a lot of uh, big in, uh, interest rate increases in the first you know quarter or so of 2023 because we don't need them anymore. Um, and so I, I'm becoming more and more convinced, and a lot of uh, economic commentators becoming more and more convinced that we're going to have a soft landing and no major recession will occur. And I'm knocking on wood that that's exactly what's going to happen. But I do think there's some bumps along the road as the markets continue to correct themselves, because I do think there's going to be some layoffs and some belt tightening with corporations that have to sort of get their expenses under control to try and deal with it. And, and I think the Fed is hoping for that as well, because unemployment is still very low. Well, it, you know, real wages have not risen during the, it's not it's not a labor market kind of thing. So I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I still think that the major causes of the inflation that we saw were, as we talked before, about supply chain issues. Um, it's not a wage price spiral in the way that we, other kinds of uh, inflation recession kind of dynamics have worked themselves out. So we'll see. Yeah. So I think the short answer is we'll see. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, there are multiple factors affecting the economy. I think inflation is at the top of the list as well in terms of, of how that goes. And relative to the real estate market here in Southern California, I don't know if you disagree with me or not, but long term, owning real estate here in Southern California is a good play. I think the fix and flip guy, that's uh, temporarily on hold for the moment. But if you're interested in buying and you make a good decision and you make a smart decision, whether it's your home or your office or your investment, and you're going to hold it for the long term, I think you'll be okay. Absolutely, California is always going to have cachet. If prices, if prices of real estate fall in Southern California, there are people in other parts of the world that will say now is the time to get that California real estate that I always wanted. Yeah, good. Well, I uh, we are out of time. I appreciate all the thoughts and the input, and uh, we got to have a longer show or something. <laughs> we'll have you back. Uh, all great stuff. I appreciate you, Ed Colson. So how? Uh, uh, well, we said if you want, if you're interested in getting more information, either on Ed on signing up for one of his classes if you're a student, or uh, if you're interested in getting involved with the Center for Real Estate, Google UCI Center for Real Estate. Uh, it's a great, uh, uh, great vehicle and, and great service to the community. And I wish you well in in your successes with the center and personally and, and with the school. Thank you so much, Barry. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. I am Barry Saywitz, president of the Saywitz Company, managing partner of Saywitz Properties. And uh, on behalf of everyone here at OC Talk Radio, our producers and everybody helps uh, to put the show together. I appreciate it. We will see you back here next week on Let's Talk Real Estate. Thanks for tuning in.
Well, there you have it. You've been listening to Let's Talk Real Estate, your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current state of the real commercial real estate market right here in Southern California. On Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio, streaming live from our studio here at the University of California Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.